a lot of the things that distract us, we want to be distracted. I think there are two major things that we need to do when we sit down and plan. Hi, it's Spade from Storyteller Therapy. This is the podcast where I give the practical, emotional, and mental support for storytellers working in careers or working on careers in film and television. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Comment below your thoughts or questions about the content. This podcast is also available on Apple iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. All right, let's get started. I'm Spade Robinson, and this is Storyteller Therapy. Hello, 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 hello. Happy Thursday. It is Thursday. There's a new episode of Storyteller Therapy, and if I may say so myself, I am super excited about today's episode because it is about what 100% of my clients deal with, with all of their projects, and I, myself, as a screenwriter, something I deal with as well. Today's episode is about procrastination, and I am so looking forward to digging into that with you. But first... Let's check in. What have you guys been watching? Like, it's that time of year when we know what's been nominated already. And I'm wondering if you guys are finding any sort of gems that have flown under the Oscar radar. Or if you guys have seen sort of everything that has been written about and talked about for the last couple of weeks. So hit me up on Facebook. You can find me at facebook.com forward slash backwards whatever slash it is story consulting services or just search facebook story consulting services and shoot me a message i want to know what you guys are checking out what is my update about what i've been watching i've seen this film more than once as a matter of fact i first saw this film when it was a little bitty baby film the name of the film is called strong island it's on netflix it's a documentary go see it i usually try to suggest films that i know that you guys can go see whether it's in the theater right now or it is on Netflix or somewhere that's like accessible. You have to see it. It's a remarkable documentary. It is a hunting film. It's a very beautiful film. I've been following this film for, has it been 10 years? I know the film has been in the making for 10 years, but when I was working at Sundance, I saw a work in progress pretty early on, years and years and years and years, many years ago. I thought it was the most stunning thing I had ever seen, especially within the documentary sphere. So I've been following Yancey Ford's career for a minute. He's taken his precious time making this documentary and I'm so glad and it's paid off heavily because it's just been nominated for an Oscar and I I couldn't be more happy. So the reason why I want you to see this film is because it is such a good version of storytelling. I think documentary, as a matter of fact, I know documentary and fiction have a lot to lend each other. And when it comes to the patience and the artistry and the narrative threads in this film, it's what you need to be looking at when it comes to putting together whatever it is that you're putting together. If you're a fiction filmmaker, I would definitely be looking at how strong the story is, how much subtext there is, what the film is about, what the film is really about, and then what the film is really, really about. Every film should at least have a couple of layers of that. And if you're a documentary filmmaker, the amount of control and attention to detail that went into making this film is incredible. I actually went to a case study for this film when it premiered at Sundance last January. It was just such an incredible panel of the filmmakers, the producer, the director, the composer, the sound designer, the European producer. The amount of detail that went into the making of this film really shows up on screen and in the soundtrack. I remember there's one moment where the sound designer was talking about every bit of sound in that film came from that house and just how he went around recording, you know, the neighborhood voices of the kids and the clanking of the pipes and just it's such an incredibly rich movie go see it definitely go see it so that is my check-in i'm looking forward to hearing about you guys' check-in and what you're seeing oh i have movie pass it's something that i think that all of you guys should get 
just so you can see as many movies as possible. I will do an entire other podcast about the importance of going to the movies, but it can be very expensive. I mean, back in the day, it was not as expensive as now. Now you're looking at a lot of money going to the theater for just one film. So movie pass is $9.99 a month. You can see unlimited films, I think, except 3D and like you can't go to the arc light. So I don't think you can see any of those films, but it's a ton of theaters all around the country. Check it out. I will leave any information that I have about it in the show notes don't hesitate don't wait just get it you're gonna it pays for itself once you see one film okay let's just jump right into the therapy session I want to talk about not only procrastination and like how to get over it but why we procrastinate what is that thing that's happening inside of our brains and inside of our hearts that causes us to do this specifically when it comes to storytelling how can we get on the other side of it so that we finish so that we complete something so that we can get to the next draft or the next cut and move forward I think procrastination is really hindering our sustainability as artists and a lot of other things so Without further ado, here we go. In the very beginning, sort of why people call me storyteller therapist is because a lot of the work that I do with writers and directors, I would say maybe 50% of it is hardcore the work. You know, hardcore the content that we're dealing with. Structure and character and tone and all the things that's going to your screenplay or your movie. And then the other 50% is a lot of mental, emotional, psychological work in terms of helping somebody get to where they need to be in order to make the most compelling version of their story. I'm not any kind of therapist, but I do understand storytellers and I do understand how they think being one. The barriers that we come against that nobody really talks about in the emotional space. My core belief in terms of how I run my company, in terms of how I approach any client that I'm dealing with, is storytelling is a study of humans or lives, you know, living things, for example, like obviously there's movies about animals or whatever, but essentially it's the study of humanity, humans. In many ways, we're attempting to study ourselves or our close ones. You know, mind you, I didn't say loved ones. We aren't always telling the story about somebody we love or somebody we know sort of that we're fond of, but people that we're close to, people that we're in close proximity to, we are grappling with ways to understand them or understand ourselves by way of this work that we're creating. And that's why procrastination is so interesting. We usually procrastinate over things that will take some sort of mental, emotional, or physical work, right? The work that we do as storytellers is mostly the mental and emotional work. But think about all the things that you procrastinate on, whether it's housework, whether it's, oh, I'm gonna get some gas, I don't feel like it, you know? Or it's a hard conversation that you have to have with someone that you aren't looking forward to. Or sort of the emotional work of being vulnerable. That can happen in a relationship in terms of like you and your boss, you and your parent, you and your girlfriend. Or you and yourself, which a lot of times when we're writing, that's sort of what we're grappling with. And we procrastinate because of that. I have a great idea for a story. I have the structure down. I know who these characters are. And for some reason, it's not coming off the page. It's just not. Like, it's okay, but it's not great. And a lot of the reasons why, and a lot of the time that I spend working with people, is sort of dealing with just that emotional openness that is required, that comes by way of not getting things organized the way they need to be organized, the focus and the actual vulnerability. When it comes to organization, it does take a level of mental work to sort of decipher in our minds what we're focusing on, slow down all the clutter that's happening in our mind, in our brain, to organize and figure out how we're going to go about this, figure out a plan, figure out what the strategy is. And that also goes along with the focus that it takes. There's a little bit of sort of mental sacrifice that it takes to focus on something. There's so many things out there that stimulate us. It's easy to get distracted. And so rearing ourselves back sort of takes that mental work. And then the emotional vulnerability associated with going to a certain place, whether it's like a place that we have to resonate with something that happened to us before or focus on something that's difficult 
or just really emotionally like open ourselves up to what is this character dealing with? How do I identify with my villain? How do I really put myself in the place of a child or someone who I don't understand or someone of a different race or a different gender? So I have five steps that can help deal with these. Number one, this is going to be super obvious, but I think it's important to talk about why and how we can do this plan. You have to plan. And a lot of times we talk about planning when we're going to write, and that's very important. But I think a lot of the things that distract us, we want to be distracted. I think there are two major things that we need to do when we sit down and plan. Number one, meals. Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times I get up and go to the refrigerator or get up and go outside of the office or get up and go anywhere to get something to eat. Plan your three square meals. Like if I am writing today, if I'm writing this weekend, what am I eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Whether I'm ordering it in, whether I cooked it, whether I meal prepped it, I need to know what it's going to be. I need to know where I'm getting it from. And I need to know where it is. For example, if I am meal prepping, then I need to be in the refrigerator in my office or my house or whatever it is that I am writing. And if I'm ordering, I've already called the restaurant and said I'd like it to be delivered at this time, period. I have my money out for my tip. Like meals need to be planned to the hilt. I don't need to be thinking about what I'm going to eat. And most importantly, I don't need to be daydreaming about what I'm going to eat because it's distracting and it can go on forever and ever and ever. And you can search forever and ever and ever. The second thing is communication. Calls, emails, anything like that. I personally, when I'm writing, I turn off my phone. I turn off my phone and I turn off my Wi-Fi. Everybody doesn't have to be that dramatic, especially if you are a parent or you're someone who people need to get in touch with. But I plan when I'm going to check my email. So if the email populates, I get a notification on my phone, anything like that. First of all, my phone is not anywhere with me. <laughs> my trick is putting my phone like in the bathroom or something. And unless I go to the bathroom, I'm not checking my phone. In general, if there are people you need to call, you need to set up your doctor's appointment. Oh, yeah, my dentist. He sent me a notification in the mail. I haven't checked my email and I'm waiting on this email. You're going to check your email at 10 a.m. and you're going to check your email at 3 p.m. and you're not checking it any other time. Right. So you need to manage like how your what your communication is going to look like for those couple of days or those couple of hours or whatever. Turning off my Wi-Fi is so key because I don't get notifications or populations or any kind of Asians that have anything to do with someone trying to get in touch with me about something that's not urgent. I will Google myself to death. I will YouTube myself to death. I will look at hair videos, 12 million breaks, check my Facebook and check my email and recheck my email and refresh my email just to make sure I didn't get a new email. It's distracting. Just stop. Just stop. You need to schedule that. So once you have that down on paper, what you're eating and how you're communicating, you should pretty much eliminate a lot of the major distractions that we have when it comes to screenwriting. Stick to that. Number two, create the bones of your story. This should happen before you sit down to write so that when you start writing, it can flow a whole lot better. What I have my screenwriters do is... Everybody writes an outline. Every writer that I know does not start with an outline, but every writer that I work with has an outline. We waste time brainstorming back and forth like what the story could be as opposed to deciding what it is and then going back and changing what doesn't work. Your outline or your bones or your beat sheet or whatever it is you create that's a spine for your story does not have to be perfect. It is not set in stone. It is not real life. You made these people up. They don't exist. Meaning you can go back and change your structure or change the plot or change what happens if it doesn't work. But you can't fix something that you haven't created. Before you shut yourself up in a hotel room and write and write and write and write, you may waste that like weekend money or time or whatever just thinking about what could happen. What happens next? You need to know what happens next before you even check in the hotel. A lot of what I do is work backwards and I have people work backwards if they can't figure out what happens next okay what's the beginning of the movie what's the very end of the movie next we usually figure out what's the bottom of the second act the lowest point what's the midpoint and then we sort of like fill in all the other like things that come in the act our inciting incident our point of no return the beginning of the end or sort of the beginning of the conclusion and then once we have those things we can go in and figure out what scenes need to happen between the bottom of the second act and beginning of the conclusion or what scenes need to happen between the inciting incident in the point of no return. My third tip, create a style or figure out what your style is. Some people watch appointment television. Some people binge. I am a binger. I'm the, listen, I binge. Like that is my life, right? So when I go to write, if I'm taking breaks, that break will be three hours and I'll be watching episodes of The Office and then I'll come back to it and then not feel like it. And they're like, well, it's five o'clock. Maybe I just, 
Maybe I'm done for the day. That can't be my style. Everything is off and I'm in it. Some people can't work like that. Some people need breaks and they are disciplined enough to take small breaks. Some people are collaborators to the hilt. If they have to sit and work by themselves, it is not, it's just not going to happen. They will do nothing but paint their nails or whatever. They have to work with another person, which is why, you know, if you have a writer's partner, that's a great thing. If I don't have that sense of accountability, I will do nothing but eat potato chips. I get it. That's not my style because I would do nothing but talk about what whatever is happening with whoever. You need to create a style and don't deviate from that. So if your style is somebody who needs to shut off everything and just binge write or just binge edit, then that's what you have to do. You can't decide, well... That's sort of like how I usually work. But if my homegirl comes over, we're going to be able to hold each other accountable and then we'll have a working session. That's not going to happen. You're not going to have a working session because you are a binge writer and you're going to get no work done. Neither one of you. My fourth step. And this is a step that I think should happen early in the process. You need to be talking about your story to anybody who would listen, to everybody who would listen. The best people I find are strangers and people who don't know anything about film. And the closer you get to finishing, the closer you get to talking to someone. So if it's on a spectrum, at the very beginning of your story, that's when you're talking to strangers and people who don't know anything about film. And then it's sort of like a heat map. The closer you get to finishing your script, the more experienced people you're talking to because they're going to have the language to help it tweak and help support where you're trying to go they're going to be able to like tell you okay what's happening is that there's no ebbs and flows like it's one note for 17 pages or what's happening is that this character has no revelation or what's happening is that you're teaching us you know a lesson as opposed to like really letting this character live etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're like whatever notes that people give but at the very beginning, you need to know whether your story makes sense outside of your head. And you will procrastinate for a really long time brainstorming with yourself because you are the only other person and you have a specific set of references. If you are talking to someone who knows nothing about film, they are the first people to tell you, I don't, I don't get it. Do not brush those people off because they didn't get like a film degree from wherever. Or because they don't know anything about the industry. Though that's your audience, right? Those are the people who will come see your film. That doesn't really make sense. I don't I don't get it. Why would he do that? I don't know anybody who would do that. Uh yeah, you need to go back to the lab on that one, right? If you have multiple people saying, especially people who don't know you, or people who don't work in film, especially when it comes to plot. Like when it comes to plot and logic, those people are golden. And then when you sort of get to your outline and you sort of like, okay, this is the beginning of and I've talked to a bunch of people about it. This makes sense. This is logical. This is what happened. And it feels compelling to me. It resonates with me as a writer. That's when you start talking to your friends who know film and pitch them the story. And those people are going to ask you hard questions. It's not easy, but that's when you want to really take in what they're saying because they're going to start asking you questions about that sounds overly complicated I just feel like you need to simplify that and in your brain it's genius but it's probably too complicated it sounds like everything is happening to your main character and they don't have they're not leading the story they're not driving the story they're not making their own decisions they don't feel active and it's like no you don't understand it's the worst day of his life and blah 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 okay no listen to your friend because they know what they're talking about i'm a big believer in independence like everybody should write the story they want to write and tell the story that they want to tell but you do want it to be compelling and because if you're only negotiating or you're only sort of consulting with yourself then it's hard to gauge what's working and what's not working or what makes sense and because in your brain you're taking things out and putting things in and you didn't replace that other thing that you took out definitely talk about the story a lot you may get on people's nerves you may bother them i don't i mean i think people especially people in film sort of like unless you're asking them to read your entire script they will sit down and brainstorm with you or listen to you or listen to your pitch or you can give them a quick call talking to people is a really important part of the process and you don't want to burn people out. So, you know, definitely spread those people out. But starting off with people who don't know anything about film, I think, or people you don't know, I think they'll be excited to talk to you. And number five, this is sort of like the opposite of procrastination. And this is why this works for me and this works for a lot of people that I work with. Um, in all of my intentions, I ask that screenwriters 
not be working on any other project. At least for the eight weeks that we're in this program, you shouldn't be writing anything else because what I want you to do is obsess about the story. I'm going to obsess about the story. I'm reading a draft. I'm looking over your homework. I'm talking to you about it. I'm talking to other people about it. I'm reading it multiple times. I'm brainstorming on it. I'm thinking about it. I'm making notes on it. I'm obsessed with your story. If I'm working with you, I'm obsessed with your story. I'm obsessed with your characters. I'm obsessed with you as a writer. I'm obsessed with the potential of where this can go. It's going to be the most compelling thing ever. I'm in love with it and you have to be in love with it. What keeps us back from really diving into it is fear. It's the fear that it's not going to be good. It's the fear that we're going to put in a bunch of effort, finally going to let our guard down mentally and emotionally and get started. We're going to make that mental sacrifice to focus. We're going to make that emotional sacrifice to be vulnerable. And the fear is that all of that effort will cause us to write something that's just not good. Newsflash is probably not going to be good the first time. And if it is, great. But if it's not, that's okay. What really battles that fear or that sense of anxiety when we sit down to write and we want to do everything else but write is going to be being obsessed with our story. The steps to being obsessed with your story, if it's if you're not already obsessed with it and you don't think it's the best thing ever or you are still having that sense of fear then you might have to do something a little more clinical that your workspace really has to reflect the story that you're working on. Visuals of the characters or what they look like in your brain. Notes about what the character's thinking. So for example, if your main character has like, um, I talk a lot about this with my clients, if they have a way of being or a way of thinking or a, a theme that sort of drives them, I would write that on a sticky note or in this card and put it somewhere. If my main character is someone who believes trust no one, you can only trust yourself. Oh, that's definitely written down somewhere, like across from my desk, for sure. If I have a good idea of what the love interest looks like, that picture is definitely somewhere in my workspace. I definitely talk to other people about these characters. That's exactly what such and such would do. It sounds crazy, but I'm obsessed with the story. I'm obsessed with these characters, what they would do, how they live, how they are, who they are, this time period in history or this futuristic world or whatever. I'm thinking about it all the time. I wake up thinking about it. I go to sleep thinking about it. When you're obsessed with your story, it is so much hard to procrastinate. It just is because it feels like it's waiting on you and it feels like it's all around you and you don't have this idea of like, what if it's terrible? What if it's terrible? It's like, no, it's not. It's not terrible. I know these people. I know them well. I know this world well. This work is going to reflect that. So I didn't have any questions this week. I don't have a Q&A um, that came through the email, but I do have a question for you guys. My question is, given what we talked about, is there a space that you prefer to be creative and if it is, share it with us. I personally find it really hard to go to a coffee shop because there's the grinding of the coffee and the music that is always playing and the people, it's just distracting for me. Some people can work there, I can't. I need to be in a completely silent place by myself with everything around me that I need that takes all of the guessing out of what I'm gonna eat and when I'm gonna take a break and all of that. So I'm curious about what that space is for you guys. Hit me up on Facebook. Story Consulting Services, shoot me a message through Messenger and just let me know what is your special spot. So for news and updates, you guys already know that you can go to my website, storyconsultingservices.com and book one-on-one -on -one consulting or download an electronic workbook to go ahead and bust out those pages or get where you need to get to to begin writing your pages. I also want to let you know that for this particular podcast, there are tools that I use to make sure that I do not procrastinate. Part of that is Uber Eats or Postmates. Those are two things that help me out. So I have left my Uber Eats and my Postmates info below. You can get, I think, $5 off your meal, your first meal free or some kind of deal. So check it out. Use my code. Set yourself up for success. Let me know how it goes. So here's your homework assignment. I need for you to sit down and make a list of all of the things that you need to set yourself up for success when you sit down to write or when you sit down to edit. Everything from the time of day that's best for you, what you're going to eat, the space that's best for you, 
whether you need quiet, whether you need music, whether you need to make sure you have your headphones in your car, if you're going to a coffee shop or always have it by your bed, if that's where you write, everything that you need to not procrastinate, to set yourself up to not procrastinate, I need you to make a list of all of those things. And that list needs to be posted somewhere before the end of the week. That is before next Thursday when another podcast come out. I need you to gather those things around. You need to set up that environment before next Thursday. Okay? All right. That's all I have. And I will see you guys next week. Bye. Again, you can send us a message. Just look us up on Facebook, Story Consulting Services, or go to facebook.com slash story consulting services, and then just send us a message through Messenger. That is all I have for today. But until next time, it's been real. Thank you for listening to this episode of Storyteller Therapy and Investing in You. Comment your thoughts or questions down below. Learn more about our labs, services, and support at atlantafilmproject.com. Stick around for the next episode. See you in a few minutes.